So page 585, um, the notes for um, statement 10 of chapter 6. Again, statement 10 is habituating to realization is practice. So here, uh, Sobish um, clarifies. He says, uh, this is like the last paragraph yeah, on page 585. Uh, if you have the ebook, it is the section for the notes for 610. He says, the present Vajra statement deals with whatever lies between the realization of the introduction, which as you know, by, you should know by now, right? In the Gagyu Mahamudra, Mm, an important point in the progress on the path is the point of being introduced to the nature of mind. So here, uh, the introduction and the complete perfect realization. So this present Vajra statement deals with what lies in between the initial introduction to nature of, realize, of mind or, or the initial realization then leading to perfect realization. And what is this? It's the accustomization and habituation to that gnosis in an unfabricated manner without being trapped or sidetracked. And so this habituation, this accustomization. So this is the kumpa, kumpa, G O M S P A. If you look at that, habituating. Gompa, meditation. Remember the other word, the meditative practice. The way you transcribe the Tibetan is S G O M rather than G-O-M-S, S-G-O-M, in, in like our transcription. Just to point out. Anyway, so getting accustomed or habituating lead to full maturation and perfect realization. Dwelling in that state, it makes no difference whether one remains in solitude or amid distraction, meaning dwelling in the state of the unfabricated, uninterrupted, undistracted, stable awareness. Then it makes no difference whether one remains in solitude or amid distraction. So that's, that's an important point there. Uh, then... Mm, Sobish gives some other explanation. Uh, the bottom of page 586, some interesting material, but not so directly relevant to this. Mm, but okay, here, yeah, not relevant to this uh, statement, but relevant to the broader understanding of uh, uh, Gilbert Rinpoche's. Um, way of handling uh, these material. And so this is good. I think this is also related to the, um, the question that Larry asked you know, uh, before the break, uh, the question on desire, uh, the, the symbolism that is often used in um, Vajrayana. So here, yeah, so 586, yeah. Um, there's a quote from the uh, Lagu Samvara Tantra that says, by turning the mind within, you obtain whichever desire, whichever siddhi you desire. You see that quote? Yeah. By turning the mind within, you obtain whichever siddhi you desire. Now, this is Sobish's translation of the original. Uh, and, and here he goes into a discussion on how this quote can also be translated differently. 
right? it can also be translated differently. Uh, and, and tells us, like, in fact, other people translate it differently. But the reason why he translated it the way he translated it is based on how Jigden Sumgun understands this quote. Uh, so in other words, Sobish's translation here matches the way uh, Jigden Sumgun understands the quote. Uh, so, so the quote itself is ambiguous enough that you can read it one way or the other. For, so for some people, they say, you know, that's why, you know, a translation, uh, that's why it's good because, you know, the ambiguities allow uh, more space to explore <laughs> what is going on. Uh, but if you're a very technical minded pe person, if you're a lawyer, you know, you'll say, no, this is bad. <laughs> it needs to be written as tightly as possible. Uh, so that absolutely no deviation uh, is possible. But anyway, that's not how tantras are, you know. Tantras, uh, and in fact, many of Buddha sutras, you know, uh, it's not about hair-splitting precision. That is the job of Abhidharma. <laughs> that is the job of like writing treatises, writing, you know, they try to really split hair. But in the sutras, in the tantras, you know, whenever the Buddha spoke, you know. There isn't this kind of hair splitting. Uh, so anyway, that quote is, by turning the mind within, you obtain whichever siddhi you desire. Now, he says, Gray. Uh, David Gray is someone who... American scholar, about my age, maybe a little bit younger. Um, he specializes in the Chakasamvara Tantra, translating the root tantras, <coughs> the related tantras, and also J. Rinpoche Tsongkhapa's commentary on uh, this tantra. I, I think uh, David Gray has done that. So Gray is an expert in, in Chakasamvara material. So he says, uh, Sobish says, Gray translates the second line, yeah, which is, you obtain whichever siddhi you desire. He translated it as, give rise to the achievement of pleasure. Yeah, Sobish translated as, you obtain whichever siddhi you desire. Yeah, so siddhi is achievement, desire is pleasure. But not just different vocabulary is used, but di very different meaning, that line. Yeah. Gray translated it as, so a fuller, uh, the full translation might be something like, by turning the mind within, so that line, basically David Gray and Sobish, yeah, translated, they're the same. By turning the mind within, according to Gray, it will give rise to the achievement of pleasure or it will produce bliss. But Sobe is translated as, by turning the mind within, you obtain whichever achievement you desire. And it says here, you know, Gray follows the Indian commentator, Barabhatta, who explains that inwardly focus means that the mind has, quote, the mode of being Sri Haruka, another name for Chakasamara, inseparable from oneself, unquote, based on which he takes the second line to indicate an outer type of worship of enjoying sensuous objects. The Indian commentator Virya Vajra, however, explains that to turn within is the arising of a consciousness with regard to the five sense objects that is without conceptualization. And this is the second reading. So Gray is basing his translation on the first commentary by Bhava Bhatta. So basically what Bhava Bhatta is saying that in this context, turning the mind within means the practitioner identifies him or herself with Chaka Samara so completely so that Right? 
all his sensory experiences have been transformed so that he or she, the practitioner now, will experience all sensory experiences as bliss. So even if you go back to the earlier discussion, even if this practitioner engages in what superficially looks like mundane sexual activity, there is no more, according to this reading, mundaneness there, and there's no dukkha being created. It's all bliss. <clears throat> okay? So this is a very tantric read. But there is a second commentator, Virya Vajra, who says, however, to turn within is the arising of a consciousness with regard to the five sense objects that is without conceptualization. <clears throat> and the second commentator is giving a commentary that is more of the Mahamudra style. So then here, Sobish continues. In Mahamudra terms, this means that an object is allowed to arise within the mind. And so you see how we talk about how in Mahamudra, you don't suppress your sensory experiences. You, you let it arise. Yet the mind remains within without grasping the ex outer object. So in Mahamudra, there's no talk or, or little emphasis or talk about, you know, enjoying the bliss, you know, that the bliss is understood as simply no grasping to the outer object. Now, I would say ultimately, right, the two is pointing to the same thing, ultimately. But then you say, well, then what's, why is it important to, to take one position over the other right? if ultimately they're talking about the same thing? Why it's important is what's more helpful to practitioners? Yeah? Because after all, when we express the teachings, it's expressed for practitioners, not those beyond practice, which is Buddhists, right? We, we don't talk about all these things for Buddha's sake, <laughs> right? We talk about all these things for practitioners' sake. So here, I think what we can understand is that it's not so much that Jigden Sungan and those who talk like Jigden Sungan uh, is arguing about at the end, uh, is it blissful or not blissful? What they are mm, arguing, if you want to put it that way, is in terms of how to communicate this to trainees, to practitioners, what's more skillful? Kyobara Rinpoche prefers this one. In Mahamudra, this means that an object is allowed to arise within the mind. So by turning the mind within, it means not, first of all, it doesn't mean Turn the mind within, block out uh, all objects, uh, all experiences from arising. No, turning the mind within doesn't mean that. It, 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 objects still arise, appearances still arise. Yet, the mind uh, remains within without grasping the objects that turn up, the appearances that turn up. Such an interpretation, Sobish continues, is closer to the Udana Varga quote above, which is on page 586. Udana Varga says, the bhikshu gathers his consciousness within, like the tortoise withdraws its limbs into its shell, and not supporting his mind on exterior things and not harming others, he does nothing to contradict nirvana. Mm. 
meaning the bhikshu, uh, the monk, right? The practitioner here, uh, does not rely on external things. He, he doesn't need to destroy external things, but he's not hooked to external things. So Sobish says, this Mahamudra uh, way of interpreting is closer to the Udana Varga quoted above. So, however, or, or therefore, I would say, Jikten Sumgun would not understand Bhava Bhattas enjoying sensual objects in any other way as he consistently reads tantric terminology in what I call Mahamudra terms. The various explanations of the second line in other Indian commentaries, so Sobish looked at other Indian commentaries, do not make the compound, uh, uh, so that, that sentence, more accessible to me, he says. So in other words, he says, he has also looked at other commentaries on that second line, and they, they don't, they don't you know, definitively say, uh, Bhava Bhattas reading, uh, uh, we agree with, or uh, Virya Vajra's way, is more accurate. So he says, Chuki Drakpa, in any case, reads the genitive as the adjective noun construction. So meaning, Chuki Drakpa, the commentaries of this Gongchik, reads it as, you obtain whichever desire, whichever achievement you desire. Rather than you obtain the siddhi of desire, as Bhava Bhatta would have it, and as Gray would have it. So the reading of, uh, when you turn your mind inwards, you obtain the siddhi of desire. It's a more, you could say, tantric reading. But the reading of, when you turn your mind inside, you obtain whatever siddhi you desire, rather than siddhi of desire, is a more Mahamudra flavor. And that is how uh, uh, Sobish says, uh, Gyoba Rinpoche consistently would read uh, explicitly like tantric uh, expressions from a Mahamudra standpoint. In fact, the next Vajra statement has to do with, you know, I think you commonly, you'll hear this uh, expression uh, when you read like uh, Vajrayana material, it'll say things like uh, uh, abandon, adopting, uh, 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 or something like uh, uh, without, uh, without adopting or discarding, uh, beyond adopting or discarding. Right? Have you come across that? Beyond adopting and discarding. Hmm? Often said, you know, the great practitioners, uh, the great practitioners of Vajrayana uh, understands that ultimately there is nothing to reject and nothing to accept. So accepting, rejecting, in other contexts is said, you know, we have to accept, we have to decide what to accept, what to practice, and what to give up. So cause and effect, right? What to adopt and what to discard. But Vajrayana texts in the Tantras, they are very provocative. They will use statements, yeah? which says, you know, you go beyond accepting and rejecting. And I see a lot of people, you know, people who talk a lot uh, will say, oh, this is beyond accepting and rejecting. But it usually means, you know, let the afflictive emotions take over. <laughs> and then they then claim, you know, I am beyond accepting and rejecting, or I'm practicing beyond accepting and rejecting. But the afflictive emotions are running amok. Jiten Sumgon is going to read beyond accepting and rejecting as 
beyond picking and choosing. I like this, I don't like that. I like pleasurable things, I don't like painful things. Yeah, he says that beyond accepting and rejecting is referring to that. It never uh, refers to uh, not uh, that it never refers to and therefore uh, implies that uh, cause and effect at some point doesn't matter anymore, which is how I think a lot of, of contemporary and ancient Buddhist teachers might talk like that. Again, here we are not so much arguing that at the end, what's the story? As in when Buddhahood is achieved. Here, if we're quibbling, we're quibbling about how to express this in ways that are most helpful and suitable to the trainees, to the practitioners. Uh, so Choki Drakpa continues, he's stating that, uh, he continues stating that the four correct abandonments and so forth arise through such inward mindfulness. These are to abandon non-virtue that has arisen, not to produce non-virtue that has not yet arisen, to produce virtue that has not yet arisen, and to guard virtue or increase virtue one has produced and so forth indicates that one produces all the virtuous qualities such as the 37 elements of awakening through this samadhi. Our other commentaries explain in some detail how one advances through habituation to realization by way of such undistracted mindfulness. The Rinjangma mentions that within the four legs of miracles, the yogi advances to the level of possessing the abandonment of the samadhi arisen from earlier mental efforts. By practicing the four correct abandonments, which is this, these four given here, uh, at that time, one proceeds within the five mental factors of complete purity to the level of mindfulness. By also practicing the four dharmas, that time, within the seven limbs of awakening, one advances to the level of perfect mindfulness. And here one proceeds to the point where Realization is practice. By continuously practicing the four applications of mindfulness, so these are you know, the, the four foundations of mindfulness. Mindfulness of body, mindfulness of sensation, mindfulness of mental events, and then mindfulness of phenomena. By continuously practicing the four applications of mindfulness, one proceeds within the eight paths of the noble ones to the seventh stage, perfect mindfulness. In this context, Jikten Sumgan is quoted with the following words. The great authoritative path of the Buddhas of the three times is continuous mindfulness. Dorshema adds two more lines. If one does not know continuous mindfulness, that is the uselessness of fickle body and speech. Meaning, uh, if mental... Uh, if the mental element of mindfulness is not present, all practices of body and speech are just rendered useless. Furthermore, Pamodrupa is quoted describing the result of uninterrupted looking at the mind as the arising of all Buddha qualities such as the 10 powers, the 18 unique qualities, and the four kinds of fearlessness in the first intermediate state. I mentioned last time, first intermediate state is this the bardo of the natural bardo of this present time. Questions or comments? Hon? Yes. What are what are the the four kinds of fearlessness. Oh, you can look up all those things. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> yeah. The 37 factors of enlightenment. Huh? You can look that up. There are a whole ah. long list of things. <laughs> And, okay. and the four fearlessness is like the 10 powers of the Buddha, the four fearlessness of Buddha, the 18 unshed qualities. These are all qualities of Buddha. Jewel ornament of liberation. Okay. Lists. <laughs> Lists of things. In other words, I have not memorized it. So. <laughs> Um, yes. When bliss is mentioned here, um, it seems like there is like a position that is something like a pleasure, but there is also like this position that is uh, like something um, good, but wait, pleasure not, is not good. Like sensual pleasure or pleasure, uh, very good pleasure. Something like that, uh, when they're saying that the um, the city of pleasure, yes, or the desire pleasure, the desire city, and so mm -hmm. the, the difference is there because there is like a, a the pleasure there is it still like mundane, or is like a different pleasure type? where. Um, where they said the city of pleasure. Yeah. So, so if it is a vaj, uh, if it is a tantric mm -hmm. reading, if you want to give a more tantric flavor to it, you will say, you will tend to read it as uh, the city, the accomplishment of bliss. Mm -hmm. A more Mahamudra read of that would be uh, the desire uh, of uh, the desired result, the desired city uh, will be reached. Is, is that part clear? Yeah. Okay, then your question now. Then... Um... But there's still the, the instructions of bliss. The what? The instructions that say that you're going to get uh, like the different stages. Bliss, um, sorry, had to go back. Bliss, when, clarity, and no thought? Yeah. Yeah, Kyobar and Bache said, don't, don't mess with those things. OK. Uh, and this bliss is sort of like, uh, mundane pleasure or it is like a sort of like a uh, something that happens that feels happy for whom for the practitioner when there is arriving to this uh, stage of accomplishment oh, first, but you say don't mess with it so <laughs> <laughs> okay Leave it alone. Yeah. Does but, this? but what is your question still? I want, I'm interested in your question still. There's something yeah. else. Like, uh, because um, when you, but because there are words that uh, seem like um, you have like a very strong experience of pleasure. Yes. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, if it is like mundane, you can get stuck in it. Yes. Yeah. So it is not like a spiritual realization. But yes. It is, yeah. mm -hmm. So yes. the yes. words are there. Yes. It doesn't seem like being mundane. Mm -hmm. Like the. Um, you're, you're basically, if I understand you right, you're basically saying. Mm hmm. Mm, you're basically asking, uh, in the Buddha state, when they talk about bliss, what is that? Yeah. It is not any bliss you know. Okay. 
<laughs> That's it, yeah. you know. All right. So the bliss of eating chocolate cake, you know. Or in my case, the bliss of eating donut, you know. Right? Okay, please don't buy me donuts. I only eat donuts in one place, which is the one in Asheville here. And even that, just one specific place. Because otherwise, I don't like donuts, just to make it clear. <laughs> but the bliss of eating donut from whole or eating chocolate cake, huh? Huh? or the bliss of, you know, seeing your kids all growing up, you know, going to college, you know, living happy life, or the bliss, you know, the, the, the secret bliss of, you know, how you achieve your orgasm, all of that, right? None of those have anything to do with the Buddha bliss. But in Vajrayana texts, in order to lure people <laughs> who are obsessed with bliss, then there's a lot of talk of bliss. Yes, it's a skillful means. But for Kyoba Rinpoche, you could say, I, in a way, he is careful and suspicious of people who go overboard talking about bliss and pleasure. So he says, not useful, you know. To focus on that. Yes, Judy. That's kind of what I was going to say. If, if we think we felt bliss, then we most likely are not there. Yes. Because if we're talking about it and excited about it, it yes. is a point. Correct. Okay. And it's an object. It's a constructed object. Then it is not. And so we, we don't know anything about all of this. So we might as well just practice. Yes. <laughs> is that yeah. We practice, you know, looking at your afflictive emotions and how that's harmful, how that's painful. Put it down. When you put it down, you have a relief. Ah, okay. Well, you want to call that bliss? Sure, you can call that bliss. But we're not there yet, so we just yes. keep on doing. Yes. Um, <laughs> so this is all very boring for some people, you know. <laughs> Especially a lot of people in Asheville will find this really boring, you know. They really like that bliss where you are sweating and sticky and and spiritual. You know. <laughs> so ecstatic dancing and you know extreme experiences, you know, sweat lodge. Uh yeah. Uh I, I, I'll admit, you know, like this, this particular take, you know, very different. You can read about, there's a recent book that came out, uh, an Indian ethnographer, anthropologist. Uh, I think she did her dissertation somewhere in the U.S. But she writes about um, these um, path of method, but not in the Buddhist context, in contemporary Hindu context. And she just came up with a book where she was write about the existence of such practices in contemporary India. Uh, a very serious book, you know, she's not, I, I don't want to make it sound like, you know, I, and if I did, I, I, I don't, this is not my final point. I don't want to say that, you know, like in the tantric material, when they talk about bliss and pleasure, uh, I don't want it to sound like um, it's making fun of people who take very seriously the possibility of transforming uh, desire, all desires, not just sexual, but sexual, of course, being human beings, that's the, one of the most powerful desires. But transforming all desires, utilizing desire as a path. I don't want to, to demean 
or to completely just say these things never exist because there is evidence that that there are systems that you know you use that <clears throat> and so um this this recent book that came out you know shows that in india there are still people who practice tantra but this is hindu tantra that apparently those lineages are alive but very obscure she says they're not going to advertise on facebook again these are people who don't want that kind of publicity they are hidden for the most part so there are you know traditions like this yeah it's not just an excuse to have fun <laughs> Although I think a lot of that is what's going on, you know, um, and misguided. But then there's also very serious. Uh, and then back in the day, you know, when when this was a living tradition in Tibet, huh, it was very serious stuff. It's not an excuse huh, to have fun, so to say. It's not. But it is very different, you know, from the lifestyle of a monk or nun, you know, very different. Uh, but nonetheless, it is taught in the Vajrayana. So I, I should also say that, you know, that there, there's that. It is said that in Jidin Simgun's own life, right, mm, when he came to Pamodrupa, he, he did not take his monk's vows. Uh, and Pamodrupa, I, I don't remember. I think Pamodrupa also did not insist. And it was only after Pamodrupa passed away, years after that, that finally Kyoba Rinpoche decided that he should take the full vows, take ordination to become a monk, and take the full vows later in life. And it is said that it occurred on the, the last straw, so to say, that that led him to say, you know, I, I really need to like unambiguously, uh, publicly, yeah. with, without any doubts, yeah, take the monk's vows. Why? It is said that it occurred on an occasion where during uh, a, a ceremony, meditation ceremony, yeah, where... Uh, feast offering was being performed. Uh, and this was, I think, uh, an occasion, if I remember correctly, um, officiated by a lama uh, who is a householder, not a monk lama. And so he has a daughter. So it said that in that uh, in that setting, this daughter approached Kyoba Rinpoche and wanted to offer herself as a partner. And it is said that at that point, Kyoba Rinpoche decided, no, I really need to like put this to rest. Huh? Meaning, you know, and, and, and the modern translations of this episode in this life kind of don't want to say so much, <laughs> so they kind of fudge it and keep it kind of vague, you know. But if you know what you're looking at, you know exactly what's going on. That In fact, there, there, there were practices like this where in the context of a feast offering, because it's the offering of desirable objects, yeah, so again, I'm not saying that this is like for fun. This is like very serious. But nonetheless, you know, Kyoba Rinpoche had come to a point in his practice where he, he did not need this kind of support. And that's, I think, crucial. He did not need to train with like a partner. And so he wanted to very clearly show that it is not necessary and, and you could say it's not necessary to take that kind of risk. And also, he said in his biography, so that it serves as an example to his disciples. 
So meaning that even though he wasn't yet ordained as monk, right, he has already given up right, all desires and attachments. But in order to make it clearly to everyone so that these occasions don't arise again and again. So then he said, I, I should formally take the vows and just dispel any and all further guessings, speculations <laughs> from interested parties, so to say. The next statements in chapter six pertains to uh, conduct. Remember it's view, practice, and conduct. Uh, view, meditative practice, and conduct. So, so habituation, you know, uh, what to avoid, uh, all that has to do with meditative practice, right? Then the, the following statements, a lot of them are dealing with conduct, which is really important. We will, but we will come back to that. Now I want to go to uh, chapter one, uh -huh. the statements there. So 18 was where, more or less where we stopped. Uh, uh, and 18 there says, all upholders of tenants uh, are basically uh, those who hold to their own position. You remember that, that one? The gist of that line is, as long as you still hold on to you know, something, you know, some philosophical position, some doctrinal position, and say, this is our position, then you are still you know, kind of, you are still tied down by something. This is said in response to those who say, um, these views, you know, these things, uh, it's only uh, a problem that non-Buddhists have. But Kyoba Rinpoche wants to point out, no, even among Buddhists, we still have, uh, we are still fettered by views, by doctrinal positions, uh, by philosophical uh, standpoints. And so as long as we are still holders of this or that view, then we are still uh, fettered. We are still shackled. We are still uh, chained. Uh, because, and then in a statement from chapter six, it says how uh, to, to, if we want to talk about view in positive ways, then None of the so-called views qualify that. Only realization of nature of mind is the final view in the positive sense. A view without fetters. A view without being tied down. Which is no views. Nagarjuna is famous. You know, I have no views, therefore I have no faults. But not, you know, like you and me now have no views. Like you and me now also basically have no views huh? because we have no idea even, you know, sometimes we have this way, sometimes we behave that way. No principle guiding for the most part. <laughs> so our no view is not Nagarjuna's no view. Nagarjuna's no view is basically no more tied down, no more encumbered, no more fettered, huh? no more attached huh, to this or that. So, so 118 is where Kibar Rinpoche says, you know, no, no, no. Don't think of this as only a problem that, you know, non-Buddhists have. Because the study of views historically is a study to refute, right? To refute wrong views. So then Buddhists tend to think only non-Buddhists have wrong views. Kibar Rinpoche said, no, actually, you know, 
until you are Buddha, you, you will still have wrong views. Then 119, he says, we maintain that in the systems of the non-Buddhists, two, there is much to be practiced that is virtuous by its fundamental nature. So this was said in response to people claim that the complete view, conduct, and practice of non-Buddhists is only something one must abandon. So there, there were people who says, you know, if it is a non-Buddhist system, then everything that they have, whether it's their view, their conduct, or practice, you know, all of that we have to abandon. But here, Kyoparambaja said, no, 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 no. Even among non-Buddhists, there are many points that they have that is virtuous. And they are virtuous because their fundamental nature is virtuous. So it doesn't matter. So this is what, like His Holiness Dalai Lama, you know, I say again and again, you know, there are these core human values that doesn't belong to anyone. And so this is like a modern way of stating this, you know. There are these fundament virtues at the fundamental level that doesn't belong to anyone. And so we should not be so narrow to think, oh, unless it has the Buddhist brand, you know, it's something that we should discard, abandon. So basically, this line is addressing that. Pretty straightforward, this line. Not much to say, except for this, you know. Uh, Sobish's notes will focus on this, this expression, virtuous by its fundamental nature. Uh, so here, uh, he, uh, Sobish brings to our attention how someone like Sakya Pandita, uh, takes exception, uh, as in he, he says, no, there's no such thing as uh, virtuous by its fundamental nature. Uh, because Sakya Bandita will say, fundamental nature is emptiness. Emptiness, there's no labels of virtuous, non-virtuous. On one level of reading, you can say, yes, Sakya Bandita, you are correct. But uh, Kyoba Rinpoche will say, here, you know, you're taking it too far. Because clearly, uh, in many places, right, um, the Buddha did, uh, gave positive qualifiers uh, to the final state. That the final state is not just uh, describe or communicate it to us in negative terms. Huh? Not this, not that, not this, not that, not this, not that. Negative terms in that way, by negation. There are also many places huh, where Buddha shows how our innate nature has compassion, has loving kindness, has joy, has wisdom. So we should not say it's all just no, no, no. So if you're interested in that issue, you can read uh, Sobish's notes. Mm. You can say that basically, you know, Sakya Pandita's approach privileges or, or uh, yeah, prioritizes emptiness. Whereas Kyoba Rinpoche uh, would say, emptiness is one side, the other side is qualities of Buddhists. Now, the issue of like uh, some of you who know these issues, in later Tibetan Buddhism, not during Kyoba Rinpoche's lifetime, in later Tibetan Buddhism, a pair of terms arose, uh, self-empty and other empty, rantong, shentong. Then that became a point of debate. So that uh, uh, it began to animate uh, debates within Tibetan Buddhism. And that fundamentally is related to this issue. Rangtong, self-empty, is the position that you could say Sakya Pandita, although again, Sakya Pandita's lifetime, Jiten Sungun's lifetime, this pair of terms, uh, the self-empty 
tradition and the other empty tradition, this pair of terms are not so, not, not, wasn't uh, used yet. It was used later. But if you want to use this pair of terms, you could say Sakya Pandita is an exclusive Rangtong, yeah? which is to say that when we speak of emptiness, it is always empty of, you know, empty of itself. That you should only speak of emptiness in that way. Yeah? The table is empty of a table essence. The chair is empty of a chair essence. You are empty of you essence. Judy is empty of Judy essence. Yeah? So empty in relation to the object. Yeah? That's all they say. Yeah? And so here, yeah? Sakya Pandita says, the ultimate state is empty and therefore even with something like virtue you have to say virtue is empty of its essence compassion he says okay sure there are buddha qualities called compassion but compassion is empty of its essence jikten sumgan will be closer to the other emptiness, but actually he would not be an other emptiness. If anything, he would be someone, if you want to put him in the terms of the self-empty and other empty, he would be one that says, look at this side, is self-empty. Look at this side, is other empty. <laughs> Because he says, yes, of course it is self-empty. Everything is empty of essence. <clears throat> but empty of essence does not mean that you cannot say, you know, there is virtue in the fundamental nature. Yeah, so that's <clears throat> 19. Yeah. Well, that discussion is not even really about 19. That is just, you know, Sobish uses that, that point uh, to bring out some of the uh, debates uh, that uh, uh, when Gongchik became uh, known, uh, where, what others thought of Gongchik uh, and then uh, try to refute what Gongchik is saying, and then how the Gongchik people uh, try to re-refute <laughs> the refutations, you know, respond to the refutations. Again, unrelated really, in my opinion, to uh, directly to the uh, statement 119, but very useful for us to, to uh, take to heart. At the bottom of 127, the Rinjangma points out that even though one might already possess vast amounts of pure qualities, one should also accept the pure qualities found in the mental continua, meaning uh, the pure quality is found in very low beings, as this is a way of abandoning pride. It was through such a practice that the Buddha was able to purify all faults and to complete all good qualities, causing him to obtain Buddhahood. On the other hand, if there is something incorrect to the uh, uh, mental continuum, that's that very technical term, I would just translate as, or I would just say it as, on the other hand, if there's something incorrect, you know, in the view of a high person, right? in the thinking of a high person, even one's guru, this is to be abandoned. And so here, you know, like, in terms of practicing guru yoga, you view your guru, your, your guru as Vajadara. But in another context, yeah, it doesn't mean to say, therefore, uh, even if the guru holds a uh, mistaken view, you accept that view. You see, these, these are the nuances of what relating to a guru means. 
Yes, of course, you know, you don't, I mean, in the first place, why accept someone as a guru when you're constantly finding problems with the way the guru is explaining things or doing things? So don't, you know, you're not forced to accept a guru, right? So don't do it. But then if you have accepted someone as a guru, yeah, because of the qualities of this person, it doesn't mean that at, from that point on, you, you don't, you know, ever see anything wrong on, on one level. At the level of meditating that he is Dharmakaya, of course you don't go, he is Dharmakaya. Well, except for this corner, this corner, this corner, this corner. Then it's counterproductive to your meditation. But, you know, outside the context of meditation, when you are having discussion with your Lama, yeah. So here is the example. On the other hand, if there's something incorrect in the in the thinking of a high person, even one's guru, that is to be abandoned. One should accept nothing merely because it exists or is thought of by a, a high person. Thus, Choki Drakpa quotes a well-known verse concerning the need to investigate the Buddha's words, like smelting, cutting, and burnishing gold. So like cutting smelting and burnishing gold, accept my instructions after due investigation. But all skillful ones do not accept it out of reverence or other reasons. Right? Then, more to the point too, uh, the story of Atisha causing his guru to abandon the Chitta Matra view and to adopt Madhyamaka is mentioned uh, in Atisha's text called Lamp for the Path. So Atisha had the greatest respect uh, for his Indonesian teacher, uh, who he said uh, really was the one responsible for bodhicitta to truly arise in Atisha, in Atisha's heart. And so he said every time uh, he talks about uh, this Indonesian teacher uh, in Tibet when he's teaching his disciples, every time he talks about this teacher, uh, he will shed tears of gratitude. But nonetheless, it is said, uh, Atisha spent 12 years with this teacher. Nonetheless, in terms of this teacher's uh, view, uh, it's still a lower view. It's the mind only, not yet uh, Madhyamaka. Whereas Atisha himself has the Madhyamaka view. So he worked with his teacher until his teacher understood or saw this, the, the higher position of Madhyamaka. So in that way, Atisha did not damage his Guru Yoga. But his practice of Guru Yoga didn't mean uh, that, oh, since my teacher uh, thinks Jitta Matra is the highest, then he must be right. Other people must be wrong. No, there isn't that kind of partiality. Uh, in fact, he inspired his teacher uh, and slowly, patiently, respectfully uh, also was able to lead his teacher to a higher understanding in terms of the question of emptiness, in terms of cultivating uh, a genuine resolve to achieve enlightenment for the benefit of all beings. Sir Lingpa, uh, that teacher, that Indonesian teacher, he says, is supreme. One twenty, one twenty one, one twenty two. Uh, these are drawing some kind of lines, so to say, which is to say, what is it that you can use to differentiate between Buddhist and non Buddhist? One twenty says, is there taking refuge in three jewels or not? If there is taking refuge, then it's Buddhist. If it doesn't involve taking refuge, then it's not Buddhist. Then within Buddha, context of Buddhist, what is the line between the greater, the great and the lower vehicle? The difference is the cultivation of the resolve. 
is that the the is that the practice of developing the resolve or not so it's related to bodhicitta but it's not just bodhicitta so we will look at that more carefully he's not saying you know that the difference of i mean generally it is said the difference between hinayana and mahayana is is there bodhicitta or not so that statement of course true but in this statement is something even more precise he says is there the cultivation of the resolve or not There's a difference between saying, is there bodhicitta or not? And is there the cultivation of bodhicitta or not? Can you see what might be the difference? Passive and active. It has to be actively cultivated, not just passively there. Because so here he says, you know, even in the lower vehicle, love, compassion, wanting others to be free from suffering, wanting others to be awake, it's there, but it's passively there. So it only becomes the great vehicle when it's actively there, which is the cultivation of this resolve is encouraged and is carried out. Then it becomes Mahayana. So this is a subtle point, but a very good point. Because sometimes, you know, uh, the Hinayana uh, level here, we're not talking about other Buddhists. Okay. We're not talking about Theravada. We're not talking about, <laughs> just right within the levels of practice we 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 might feel you know like uh oh you know i feel compassion you know then you think it's sufficient right according to this you know that the, the the more hard point being made here and this is not no this is not like these three statements isn't made for you to then go around looking oh is maria carmen buddhist or not is Adriana, you know, uh, Hinayana or Mahayana, you know? No. Yeah. Is, is Bill, you know, uh, entered uh, uh, Vajrayana yet, yeah. which is the third, the third statement on 22. 22 is it says, uh, the line between uh, general Mahayana uh, and secret mantra uh, is empowerment, right? So these three lines, these three statements are not given so that you use that to go see if other people are or not. It's used for you to keep refining your level. So, so that, that first point, so if we, rather than going to each of these statements in details, uh, so the first point, 20, the difference between Buddhists and non-Buddhists is taking of refuge, right? So here is saying, again, it's not about the label, am I Buddhist or not Buddhist? Here it's about uh, the definition of Buddhist and non-Buddhist basically. Are you genuinely on the path yet or not? Then it says, if you want to know that, Check it with, how often am I taking refuge in Buddha, Dharma, Sangha? Then you will know. Now, what might trick you into thinking you are Buddhist, you are on the path? Meaning, what are the traps? What are the uh, sidetracks? What can you think of? What might give you a false positive <laughs> in this virus times? 
What might give you a false positive that you are Buddhist? <laughs> that it may offer some protection from bad things, for what we consider to be bad things. Mm. When in fact, it's not God. No, no. What, what, what would give you a false positive? Let's restate your answer. I think it's your answer is somewhere there, but let's 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 answer what might give you a false positive. Right? A true positive here, it says, is you find that you are taking refuge. Yeah? In different scenarios that turn up in your life, you know, you're taking refuge. Then what might give you a false positive? That you turn that somehow into its destiny, its um, because it's determined, predetermined somehow that you think I, I don't know. I'm not. I don't know. Go ahead, Bill. Bill? I was going to say, is it uh, if it's supporting the concept of I, of self? <laughs> I see where Judy and Bill are both coming from. Mm -hmm. Any any guesses? I'll give you a hint. Look look at the counter statement that it is addressing. What does it say there? And then what does it mean for you and me? Is it speaking to going through the motions of taking refuge rather than? Uh, this is not based on the counter statements, right? I mean, it's a good, it's a good one, but this is not, uh, or uh, are you linking it to the hint I gave you? No, I was not. Oh, okay. okay. What about take that hint and see where, where y'all can go with that? And the four seals here, uh, in case you all don't remember, it's that uh, all things are imp all compounded things are impermanent. Uh, all afflicted states are suffering. Mm -hmm. All things are not self, and nirvana is peace. Uh, these four, these are the four seals. Uh, it, it said seals, and in this context, seals means like the seal of authentication, or, or, or authenticity. If you want to know if something is taught by the Buddha or not, does it have these four seals? Yeah. They are called four seals. So different from the seals we were talking about earlier, and. And for sure, not the animal, huh? Seal. <laughs> so what 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 does the counter statement there? If I say that is a hint. So firstly, what does the counter statement say? Yeah? Can you restate? Somebody restate the counter statement. Can someone rephrase the counter statement? What this Gongchik statement is uh, correcting. Hello, somebody. I don't know that I can restate it very well, but other non Buddhists can actually express these four seals in, ah. in their own religious training or or some other it doesn't have to be religious they can they can authentically uh try to see the world in this way but yes but that doesn't make them practitioners it's the it's the fact of 
having some kind of trust in yes. Guru as exactly exactly so here is saying just having the view is not enough there's so many people these four seals you know you walk around in Asheville you know you're going to run into people who do this right but they're not going to practice the Dharma they're not going to take refuge If you say, oh, all compounded things are impermanent, subject to change. I mean, anyone who, you know, can logically, without mental impairment, you walk them through that, they will say, oh, yeah, yes, <laughs> right? Uh, and anyone, you say, you know, all afflicted uh, states uh, entail dissatisfaction. Yeah. Given enough time, you, you, you can convince someone that says, yeah, I see that, you know, as long as, you know, there's self-interest, which is how it becomes afflicted, then of course it will entail dissatisfaction. Now, even if it is the noble love of a mother for a child, who can say there is no pain there? Of course there is. And he's like, oh yeah, I get that, right? So you can see how, you might hold that uh, to be true, but if you don't take refuge, you're not a Dharma practitioner, which is what Buddhist and non-Buddhist means. It's not like, you know, I'm Buddhist, you're not Buddhist, you know? So this is a crucial point, and this is relevant to us, you know? We might think we are Buddhist, as in we have started practice, but all that has happened perhaps at best is we accept, you know, the truth of the four seals. But, but accepting the truth of the four seals and not actually embarking, not having trust in Buddha Dharma Sangha, not taking refuge, just accepting those four doesn't deliver any significant result. This is not about, you know, increasing the population of Buddhists. This is not about, you know, that in the census we have better numbers. This is not about recruiting. This is about, this is directed to practitioners already, or those who self-identify as I'm a practitioner. And you have to ask yourself, really? See, in fact, there's a book, you know, right? which I like a lot, you know, What Makes You Not a Buddhist, right? By Jones Akensen. Right? There, yeah? according to that book, the standard of Buddhist or non-Buddhist is based on whether you accept these four or not, right? But Kyoba Rinpoche here says, not yet, not yet. Even if you accept those four, if you don't take refuge, then you're not yet. on this path. Chris. And sorry, the, uh, so you were also suggesting that then refuge doesn't count if you don't no, trust no, your refuge guru. counts. Right, of course. <laughs> I love, but the, 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 the faith in the guru was the point you were saying. Is oh, no, that's, that's just, you know, further down the road, all of that, but. Okay. Refuge. Yeah, then, then to the degree that Guru comes in, Guru is the embodiment of Buddha Dharma Sangha, you know. But the key point is still Buddha Dharma Sangha. If you, if you accept, oh, all things are subject to, uh, so all things are impermanent, unstable, all things are suffering, uh, all, all condition, all afflicted states are suffering, right? Uh, and all phenomena whether compounded or uncompounded, is without self. Nirvana is peace, right? And then you don't take refuge in Buddha. And what does that mean, don't take refuge in Buddha? Meaning, you don't think Buddhahood is possible. You see, you can accept those four things huh? and not think, you know, freedom from suffering is possible. Then you're not Buddhist, meaning you're not on the path.
So this also cautions us to not mistake, you know, intellectual appreciation, intellectual acceptance to be the transformation that we need to experience. And the transformation can only come if we take refuge. Sincerity now, again, devotion, sincerity. Refining our intentions. And then likewise, you know, the line between Hinayana and Mahayana, right? Again, if you treat this as, you know, just like an exercise of knowing what is Hinayana, what is Mahayana, and this is, tends to be how it's taught in, you know, the Shedra, in the classes that we're so used to, you know, and then the definition, left, right, up, down, three points to that, seven points to that, you know, all those, of course, is very helpful if you know how to use them. But if you don't know how to use them, right, you get lost in all these lists. Then you go through the motions of like, oh, Hinayana is where there's no bodhicitta. Mahayana is where there's bodhicitta. But what does that really mean? <clears throat> it's not sufficient just to know that. But it's to then take this and say, you know, and I, am I being complacent thinking, yeah, you know, I, I, I feel love for people. I, I feel compassion, you know. I, I, I must be Mahayana. You know, I mean, we don't, we don't walk around going, am I Mahayana or not? But basically, you know, if you feel like, oh, I have compassion, I have love, then you think, yeah, I'm good, you know? So put it in these terms, you might think, oh, now I'm Mahayana, you know? But here Kyoba is saying, no, no, no. Until you make it active, until there is the cultivation of this resolve, until this becomes kind of a priority and not just like incidentally, passively, it's there. Of course it's there. If, if love and compassion is natural to our innate state, of course it's going to be there. But just because it's there is not enough. You have to actively cultivate it then you have entered the great way. Then the, the statement about empowerment, right? Again, you know, if you get caught up in the superficial, right? like, oh, did you go to the empowerment? Did you not go to the empowerment? Did you get it? Did you not get it? You know, and therefore that will make you qualify for me to tell you about Vajrayana or not qualify to tell you about Vajrayana. A lot of times people get caught up in that, you know. So much so that when the Dalai Lama was giving the empowerment virtually, uh, there is like this one big name Lama. Uh, I am sure he didn't mean for this to become public, but he was chatting with his friends and very dismissively said, you know, ah, the Dalai Lama is destroying the Dharma, doing these things, publicizing empowerments, blah, blah, blah. Somebody recorded that and uh, released it, you know. And of course, there was a big storm, you know. Then majority of us condemning him because Tibetan society, if you say anything disrespectful to the Dalai Lama, that's the end of your, you know. That part is kind of unfortunate, you know, like uh, because the culture still, you know, you say anything that you disagree with the Dalai Lama, oh, people will just be so angry, you know. And that's not healthy, I think. But that's a Tibetan matter, not, not our problem so to say, so not for us to try to change them. And this is their own business. They have to change themselves. Um, but then there are also others who stood up for this Lama to say, you know, well, according to this text and this text and this text, you know, yes, you know, Dalai Lama, what he's doing, you know, it's not allowed, da, 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 this, that, 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 all of that. Missing the point. Here is not about that as we have talked about, what is the real meaning of empowerment, right? It's nothing to do with how many vases is present. Huh? Do you have to be physically present or physically not present? Huh? 
right? As I said, even if you're present, you know, 90% of what happens when you're present is all to be imagined. <laughs> right now, think all oh, the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas are the 10 directions, you know, coming and putting this on your head. As I put this, as I put this on your head, you know, don't think no, it's just this. Think that it's da da da. Then they argue and fight over is this necessary? Come on. Really? Missed the point. So hear this line, statement 22nd. It's not eh, about the superficials of what empowerment is and it's not. But here it's saying, you know, if you want to know, you know, have you entered the secret mantra way? Then you ask yourself, has empowerment ignited? So again, here, the counterposition is, you know, so each of the counterposition actually illuminates yeah, what the statement yeah, is pointing to. Often what the statement is pointing to is something very crucial, but not easy to see unless you look at what the counter statement is. So I did not cover the counter statement for the bodhicitta, but next time we'll look at that. And likewise for the secret mantra counter statement. Meanwhile, you can read the commentaries and the notes from Sobish. Good. I'm sorry, uh, class has gone on so late. Uh, and I know that uh, we might be delaying, you know, some of your plans, uh, causing some complications. Sorry for that, I got carried away, went on and on and on. But before we end, and before we do dedication, I want to w wish Patricia, Facebook says today is your birthday. You might have some plans for your birthday. And if we're holding up your birthday plans, <laughs> thousand apologies. <laughs> Pandemic times celebrating birthday is uh, rather interesting. So, um, if there's any consolation, you know, my big 50, you know, got ruined by the stupid virus. <laughs> we all think like that, you know, it's all about me. <laughs> so anyway, happy birthday. Gracias. Happy birthday. <laughs> Gracias. Uh, so now. Feliz uh, cumpleaños. Feliz cumpleaños, <laughs> Patricia. Muchas gracias. So have a good birthday, uh, and now we dedicate merit, uh, and then dedicate merit to long life, healthy life, and all of that, and whoever else is having birthday. Uh, <laughs> So healthy, long life of bodhicitta, very important. <laughs> so we pray for that. So as long as that is healthy, that lives long, then whatever the changes to the body, doesn't matter. Likewise, when the with the you know when we do prayers for the long life and the health of the Lama, uh, yes, good if the external Lama uh, is around to guide, but the more important Lama is the inner Lama, healthy, strong, stable. Mm -hmm. So this is why you know we say uh, the Buddha system is not a theistic; it's not an external system. So the, the term that, uh, for example, Sobis translate as Buddhist and non-Buddhist, the literal term in the Tibetan is Nangpa uh, and not Nangpa. Uh, what is Nangpa? 
ng paa, the insiders, those who follow the inside path, anangpa, as opposed to those who follow the external path. So the inside, our own mind, is most crucial. So remember that. Ata. Thank you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday.